country is like a great river, always the same but constantly changing, each winter resembling the one before, but each like no other. Winter is a season that demands respect, insists on it. It is a season that refuses to be ignored. Winter is a season that never leaves us. It is forever a part of who we are, what we believe and value, and how we see the world. I don't think I really understood and was able to put into words at the time. But when I was growing up on the farm, everything that we did in spring, summer, and fall was done because of winter and in preparation for winter. Everything from planting the oat crop to getting the chicks in spring, all of that, all of those activities were done because we knew winter was coming. And winter meant we had to have available for the livestock and the chickens sufficient feed to last throughout the winter months. For the family, we knew we had to have a garden. We knew that we had to raise some hogs that would be butchered in the fall, that we would have enough to eat during the winter. So everything, everything, the whole cycle of the seasons, winter was the premier, was the first place season. Today we tend to discount it as sort of, oh Lord, winter is coming again and we're going to have to put up with snow and cold and all of that. We didn't look at it that way. We looked at winter as something that had to be respected because it was coming. And we, we were not opposed to it. We looked forward to it. We tried to and did enjoy it. But we also knew that we are going to spend a lot of time preparing for it. And that we did. A Farm Winter with Jerry Apps was funded in part by Holiday Vacations, Ron and Colleen Wires, the Edward J. Okre Foundation, the Wisconsin History Fund, with support from the National Endowment for the Humanities, and the Friends of Wisconsin Public Television. My earliest memories, which are in the late 30s and then through the 40s and early 50s, winters were considerably different than they are now. Winter usually dependably started about the middle of November, and meaning that's when we got the first significant snowfall. And by, um, oh gosh, I can remember into April having snow on the ground. So that's a long, that makes a long season. And not only that, but with snow cover, it was not unusual to have 10 below zero in November. It was not unusual to have 30 below zero in January. I can remember 35 below zero. Well, the snow was not melting. It just kept accumulating until we would have three, four feet of snow on the ground. Winters were fierce. But along about early November, when the barn was full of hay and the corn cribs were full of corn, and the first heavy frost had come and the leaves were down from the trees, and everything was drab and brown and boring, we looked forward to the change in the season. Really, almost a celebration. 
was when we brought the wood stove in from the woodshed and set it up in the dining room. Of course, the kitchen wood stove, cook stove, had been there all the while because my mother used it all through the summer as well. It was a round oak heater, it was called. The thing weighed a ton. And, and we'd ask the neighbors to come, and we'd slide planks under this thing, carry it into the dining room, and try to line it up with where the stovepipe should go. And once they get the thing all lined up, and they would stand there and say, yep, I think, I think we got her. Uh, my dad would say, well, we're going to check it out. And he would uh, start the fire. Everybody would stand there in anticipation. Now, is the thing going to smoke? My mother's standing off in the bat. And you could tell if the thing wasn't just right, it'd smoke like everything. I mean, the room would fill with smoke, and then they had to readjust the thing. But if they had done it properly, they would all smile and go out in the kitchen and drink coffee and eat cookies and sort of celebrate that the stove was in place. Now, at the time, that's when we closed off the rest of the house. So we closed off the parlor, closed off the back bedrooms, closed off the upstairs bedrooms, except for the one that was supposedly heated by the stovepipe, because at that time, my two brothers and I, we all gathered now in this one bedroom. That's where we would spend the winter. Uh, these old houses looked enormous, and they looked like they must really be comfortable and doing well. And they were so cold. They, they just were. Now, having said all of that, in the next preparation for winter, we had to enhance our wood pile. So we had to make wood. And making wood was an enormous project when you think about it. Now, mind you, there were no chainsaws. We had a cross-cut saw. Each of us had an axe. So grab the axe, grab the cross-cut saw, and out into the woods and find this old tree. And those who know about cutting wood know that uh, you first have to notch the tree. You do that with an axe. You notch the tree in the direction that you want the tree to fall. And my dad was had an uncanny ability to walk around the tree and look at its natural lean. You can't decide where the tree should fall. The tree knows where it wants to fall. It's for you to figure that out. And so you notch it in the direction that it looks like it's going to fall. And then you grab this cross-cut saw, which is, what, six feet long or so, with wicked, wicked teeth on it. And grab one handle, heave the other handle, and one of the things that you learn in using a cross-cut saw is that you never push, you always pull it. And if you try to push it, you jam it up, binches. So pause, pulling, and I'm pulling, and pause, pulling, and I'm pulling, and pause, pulling, and I'm pulling. And my arms are about to fall off. And then we hear a cracking noise. Oh, I've been waiting for that noise. And my dad yells in that time-honored announcement, timber, and the tree crashes to the ground. This explosion of broken limbs flying in the air. And that's just the beginning of our work. If you thought that cutting it down was a problem, because now with our axes, we trim off the smaller branches and then we start sawing the trunk into probably six foot hunks. And we pile the brush in a pile for the rabbits. Pa says, gotta have a place for them to spend the winter. And when we've done two or three trees or more, we hitch up the team, Frank and Charlie, to the bobsled. And I can't, I, I, I can't comprehend the fact that these huge hunks of oak wood must have weighed hundreds of pounds. We would roll those logs up onto the sleigh and we would haul them up to the house, back of the house, put them in an enormous pile. And then Pod get on the phone to Alan Davis and Bill Miller and Freddie Rapp and he'd say, can you guys come over and help saw wood on Saturday? Sure. And the expectation is that each one of them will have the same thing sometime or another, because everybody changed work with each other. And Guy York, a neighbor half a mile away, had a circle saw. It was about four feet across, and there would be the loudest noise you could imagine as that circle saw bit into the oak wood, and one man was in charge of throwing away, meaning he stood holding the piece of wood to be cut off and then threw it in a pile. 
and it was dangerous. My gosh, it was dangerous. There were, there were no guards of any kind. That big circle saw ran free, its teeth cutting into the saw, cutting off your arm if it got in the way. And they all go home, tired, it's a miserable job. Now here's this big pile of wood, and what's the next thing we're faced with? One thing I learned very early on is there, as almost everything else in farming, there's a skill to doing it. And splitting wood is, is right up toward the top. Because one of the things that my dad taught me was how to read a piece of wood. And you strike that block of wood with a splitting maul so that you work with the wood rather than against it. And what a thrill it is when that happens. Because when you're learning, you either strike over the block, you miss the block, you hit it on the side. It requires a fair amount of eye-hand coordination to do this. And we piled the wood in the woodshed. And then the duty of the kids, when we were three, four, or five years old, was to take wood from the woodshed and put it in the wood box, in the kitchen and in the dining room. So there was a lot involved in, in making wood. Uh, sometimes people say things like, well, when you make wood, you're twice warmed. How foolish that is. You are many times warmed when you make wood. <laughs> I remember so clearly a year in about the 15th of November, and my dad had an uncanny ability uh, to predict the weather. He watched the direction of the wind, he uh, watched the sunset in the evening, he watched the formation of clouds. He never talked about this, he never talked about how he did it. But he would say one morning, did say one morning, when we were on a, getting ready to go to school, walk to school, he said, you better wear your boots today, it's going to snow. And we looked at him like he was nuts because it hadn't snowed ever so far this season. So we take our boots and we trottle off to school. And about mid-morning, we're looking out the window, doing long division or whatever I was working on. And there was this first little flake of snow, and then there would be another one, and then another. And it would hit the, this big long window, and then you would see a little trickle of moisture come down when the snow flake melted. And then another, and another, and another. And we all perked up and looked out the window, and we're supposed to be paying attention because it was the first snow. And we were, we were like young calves let out of the barn in the spring. We're all outside and we're looking up at the sky. It sounds so silly. And the snow is coming down ever more and we are running around and yelling. And one kid says, I think we have enough snow to play fox and geese. And fox and geese is a game that you play in the snow. We played it in our little softball diamond. And you walk a big circle, everybody one after the other. And then you do a cross, that circle. And then there's a place in the middle. That's home spot. And fox and geese means that one person is the fox. It's a kind of tag game. And the kids run around, the fox tries to catch them. When you get in the middle, you can stand there and the fox can't catch you because that's a free spot, but only one person can be there at the time when you get in there and the person has to leave and back running around. And the fox is tagging these kids as they're running around. And the last person to be tagged, that person becomes the next fox. Oh, what fun it was. We've been waiting all fall because we've been playing anti-eye over and run sheep run and all those kinds of outdoor games, waiting, waiting for that we could play fox and geese. And then the snow accumulated enough and somebody said we ought to have a snowball fight. Well, a snowball fight. 
in a country school was something to behold. We had a rule, a number of rules. You never ever hit a kid in the head with a snowball. That was an out and out no-no. And whenever somebody was hit in the head, which they were on occasion, we as a group sort of determined if one, it was an accident and then it would be overlooked, or if it was on purpose, which it was sometimes, and now a collective judgment had to be made. Did this kid deserve to be hit in the head with a snowball? Had he done something to the kid throwing the snowball that deserved a punishment in return? Or had this kid throwing the ball done this maliciously? Once we figured that out, and kids had a, have an uncanny way of figuring things out, if we figured out that the kid deserved it, nothing more was said. If we figured out that this was a malicious act, we would grab this kid that threw the snowball, throw him down in the snow, and wash his face with snow and push snow down his neck so he would never do this again and would remember that there are rules in snowball fights. That was something very democratic, I would suggest. We were learning early on how to care for problems within our midst. We were very fortunate. Our grandmother was a knitter. And almost every year for Christmas, we would receive from Grandma Witt new wool mittens. And she also made for each of us a woolen scarf, huge scarf that you could wrap around your head three times keep your ears from freezing, your nose from freezing, and anything else from freezing on your head. Well, after one of these snowball fights, wearing our woolen mittens, and all, most of the kids had woolen mittens, or I don't, I don't remember anybody having gloves, most, most of them had mittens. All these wet mittens were hung around the wood stove in the back of the school. And if you've ever smelled a wet sheep, that was the smell in the back of our schoolroom because there was this tremendous smell of wet wool as these mittens were drying, mixed in with the hint of oak smoke coming from the stove. And if it was close to noon, on top of the stove was a pan of water into which those of us who brought jars of soup from home all of that was bubbling, and so the smell of the soup that was warming and the wet wool and the oak smoke provided a kind of intermingling smell that I've never forgotten. Smells are something we often don't think about in our memories, but smells have tremendous impression on us. They are embedded in our memories, and I can think about these kinds of smells uh, forever. Well, you should be out here when it's 10 below zero, you know, cold weather like. How much ice you got there, about six inches or eight? Right now? Yeah. Oh no, we're at, there's 18 inches of ice right there. 18 inches? Yeah. Oh my gosh, I The can't. whole spoon will go down, I'll show you. Oh really? Oh yeah, the whole spoon will go down. Look at that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I guess you're not worried about falling in. No. no. As soon as the lakes froze up, which would happen in those days by uh, mid-November, and ice fishing really was best early in the season when the fish were more active. We would do all the chores by, oh, nine o'clock or so in the morning, and we would load into our old Plymouth car our tip-ups, which are the devices used to fish through the ice, and an ice chisel and some minnows and we're off to Mount Morris Lake was our favorite lake that we had gone many, many times just east of Wild Rose. And in those days, you could build a fire, a campfire on shore, and we would do that. And then we would chop holes in the ice. Now the holes, there's a tough job. We didn't have a fancy auger or anything like that. The ice chisel that my dad used, which is really interesting, was the rear axle of a Model T Ford car. 
and the blacksmith in Wild Rose. Arnold Christensen was his name, Danish chap. He heated the end of that steel and flattened it out and made it sharp as a knife. And the other end, he drilled a hole through it and we put a leather piece in there. The embarrassment that is of considerable magnitude if a ice fisherman punches a hole in the ice and forgets to put the leather thong around his wrist and when the ice chisel punches through that last quarter inch or so of ice and goes into the water if you are not holding it properly in other words if you don't have it around your wrist it will sink to the bottom of the lake to be there forever and we would chop the holes maybe eight, 10 inches across. Big embarrassment, hole too small, fish too big. What do you do now? <laughs> we all hope for that, but <laughs> set up all of these tip-ups, which are little wooden devices, which when the fish takes the minnow bait, it tips up and there's a little flag that waves in the wind and you know that there's excitement. When all that's done, then we all assemble around this little campfire that we have. Smoking away on shore, there's my Uncle Fred and my Uncle Ed and my Uncle Wilbur and my dad, my two brothers, and sometimes the Kolka boys. We all sit there looking out at the lake on this cold, wintry day, maybe a few flakes of snow coming down. And the men and uncles start telling stories. Stories about deer hunting, stories about rabbit hunting, stories about making hay, but stories mostly about ice fishing. Ice fishing in another day, in another year, when the fish were bigger and the cold was stronger and the snow was deeper and the ice was harder. Everything was more than it is now. And I would listen to all of that and marvel at how these guys could lie to each other. That's why my mother, they're just sitting there lying to each other. They're telling these wonderful stories, one, and they're trying to top each other. And in the middle of a great story, one of the flags goes up, and we know there must be something going on out there. And we all race out on the ice, and we gather around the fisherman who strips off his gloves and grabs that wet line, and it's colder than thunder, and we're all watching because this is going to be an exciting moment. And so he gives a gentle pull on the line. And the line shoots out of his hand because it, indeed there's a fish on. And it's troll. The line is just going. And we're all going, my gosh, that must be a big one. Oh, but it's five pounds. Oh, but it's ten. And I stand there with my mouth open watching. And so he's pulling hand over hand. And the wet line is gathering on his boots and it's freezing solid almost the time that it hits the ice. And he's pulling and he's pulling and the fish is going out some great distance. And we're wondering if it's still on or not. Is the fish still on? Yeah, it's still on. You can feel it. And more and tugging and more. And we're just all standing up. And the audience is saying, oh, pull him faster, pull him slower, let him go, pull him in. I mean, it's a full of more contradictory advice you ever could imagine. And then we look down in the hole, and there's this massive, massive head appears. Now, a northern pike with its mouth open is something to behold because it has the sharpest teeth, the most vicious-looking fish you could imagine. And the fisherman unhooks the hook from the northern pike, puts another minnow on, and feeds that frozen line back down into the hole to wait for the possibility that another fish may come by yet this day, and that he may have one more fish to add to his collection and to his repertoire of stories. Because every fish caught has a story. And now we're all back sitting around the fire again, and we're commending and complimenting and slapping the guy on the shoulder that he's done a wonderful job, and he doesn't have to say much of anything because he knows He's done a wonderful job. And he knows that he's listened to his own advice on how to catch a fish because there is a considerable skill to catching a northern pike through the ice. And he knows that. And the audience knows that too. And that process was repeated again and again and again. If fishing was good and the day was right, there might be half a dozen times or more 
in a day that that little episode would be repeated. Each time exactly like the previous time, each time profoundly different from the previous time. <laughs>
And so he was bing, 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 pretty good. And he was turning these crows over one after the other. Pretty soon he got bored with that. Well, my dad is sitting by the stove, the round oak heater in the dining room, and he's reading the paper while we're mussing around with our toys. And, and my brother, what got into him? I don't know. My dad used to smoke cigarettes, and he was smoking a cigarette at the time. And my brother Donald takes aim with his little cork gun and goes bloop. And darned if he didn't hit that cigarette straight on and it flew on my dad's mouth on the floor. My brother Daryl and I were aghast. This would be the most severe punishment that could ever be meted out. I mean, we couldn't wait to see what was going to happen to my brother Donald, who himself was so surprised. <laughs> that his shot had been so accurate. My dad picks up the cigarette, puts it back in his mouth, and looks over at Donald and says, that was a pretty good shot. Only Christmas morning, I think, saved the day. One of the interesting things that we always did on Christmas Day, after we'd opened the presents and we'd had our noon meal, we had neighbors just to the north of us. Alan lived there with his daughter. His wife had died some years earlier. And they were poor as poor could be. And on Christmas Day, my mother always baked an apple pie uh, for them. And she would buy a couple of little presents. And my brothers and I would go down there in the afternoon and they would welcome us. Oh, they would welcome company. They were wonderful people in that respect. And going into their house, there were no decorations, no Christmas tree, no sign that it was Christmas at all. And they would be sitting by the wood stove. And we would sit there and we would talk with them. And they would ask us how things were going and what presents we got for Christmas. And I would give them the apple pie. And my mother had purchased a pair of gloves, work gloves for Alan, which I gave him. And she'd gotten a little frilly handkerchief, which she had for Catherine. And I knew, as did my mother know, that's the only presents that they got. And when I left, my brothers and I left, Alan said, thank you. Thank your mother. And Catherine said, thank your mother for me too. And she had tears in her eyes. That helped me understand. There's a lot, there was a lot more to Christmas than, than receiving books and sweaters and other presents. My dad would say, there's a big storm coming. And the sky was just cloudy. There wasn't anything unusual. The wind wasn't blowing. And yet he knew somehow. And so this particular day, he said, boys, we're in for a bad one. And it was snowing just ever so little bit as we were walking to school. Didn't amount to much. As the morning wore on and we were doing our lessons, and the snow is coming down ever harder. We can feel the wind. The wind is rattling the schoolhouse windows. The wind is sending the snow under the windows and it's building up on the windowsills on the inside of the school. Did that at home too, by the way. And it, it, it's, it's sort of marvelous, really. As a kid, you look at that and say, this is really kind of interesting. And as we got to recess time, Ms. Thompson, our teacher that year, said, I don't think you ought to go outside for recess. She never said that, but she, she knew what was going on. 
You could not see 10 feet in front of your face by recess time, it was snowing so hard. Around two o'clock, maybe 2.30, the fathers began arriving. Now mind you, nobody drove anything, they were all walked. My dad finally comes and he stomps off his boots and it's cold, it's getting really cold too. And these fathers are all gathered around the stove and they're slapping their hands together and they're warming them on the stove. And Miss Thompson is saying, well, how, what's it like out there? And uh, the fact that it was dangerous, we all knew that. Nobody talked about that. It, you didn't worry much about that because we'd been there before. Well, now we're heading out the door and of course we got our big boots on and Pa is making the trail. Now you learn in the winter, the deep snow, that you don't everybody walk alongside of everybody else. You walk in a single line. Pa's at the head of the pack and Daryl's next and Donald's next and I'm bringing up the rear. I can hardly see Pa in the front and it's only a few feet ahead and the snow is blowing and it's hitting us in the face and it's hitting us in the eyes and it is terrible. And the wind is howling so that we cannot hear each other. And Pa says, don't stop for whatever reason without telling me. So we go almost to Miller's place, which is um, mostly halfway. And Pa calls a halt and we stop and rest by a huge snowbank that the snowplow had made from earlier snowfalls. And the snow is sifting over the top of this big snowbank and, and sifting down on us. And, and it, 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 we're, we're not terribly uncomfortable. We're, we're, we're sort of excited by it all. And then we continue on. The first notice that we're getting home is you catch the smell of wood smoke. I can't see the buildings, but I can smell the wood smoke. And finally, we clutch up along the driveway and get up to the house and sweep off our boots on the porch. We swept the snow off of each other because we looked like so many, each one of us, and into the kitchen and there on the kitchen stove was a big pot of homemade vegetable soup steaming away. Oh, what a wonderful, wonderful thing it was to come into the house, be warm by the stove, and have vegetable soup. That was just the beginning, of course, because we were safe, but now we've got to contend with the chores. We found our way to the barn, did the chores, and it was eerie because when you go up in the barn to throw down the hay, to hear the wind howling, rattling the barn, roaring around the corners, it, it was unbelievable. And it, I don't know if it was fearsome, I suppose, but I can't remember being terribly afraid, other than just being amazed at all of these unusual sounds. The cattle, they didn't seem to mind. They threw down the hay and the silage and they, they were, content and happy was always uh, warm in the barn. And then back into the house, and you might ask, well, what about what happened when the power went out to, in the middle of all of this storm? Well, the power didn't go out because there wasn't any power. Uh, we, had, we didn't have electricity. And we went to sleep with covers just thick on us. And again, hearing the sound of the wind howling and wondering how long this is going to last. And by the next morning, the wind has stopped and the landscape had been completely transformed. All the sharp edges were gone. It was a land of black and white and a blue sky. It was kind of pretty, colder than thunder. After these big blizzards, the temperature would plummet 10 below zero, 20 below zero, 30 below zero, colder than anything. And so what would we be doing the next morning? Well, we would be shoveling paths. Paths to the pump house, paths to the barn, paths to the chicken house, paths to the granary, paths to the outhouse, paths everywhere. And now the problem that we had was what to do with the milk because we had enough storage space for maybe two days, and we knew that the roads were completely impassable, and we didn't know how long they would be, so the milk truck could get in. And so we filled up all the cans with milk by the second day, filled up the washing machine and the wash tubs, filled up all the pots and pans and everything we could find, 
We even made butter. My mother said, you got to try and make some butter. So we made some butter from some of the cream. She made some cottage cheese from some of the milk. And finally, I don't know, third, fourth day, middle of the night, we could hear the roar of the snowplow. The snow was as hard as a rock, and you could hear this big four-wheel drive diesel truck, snowplow, charging forward and backing up, charging forward and backing up again and again. And that was the sound that we heard all night long, but we knew, we knew that the next day, the milkman would arrive and things would come back to normal, mostly. And my dad would sometimes remind us that if you think you're in charge of things, you're not. There's something else in charge, and that's Mother Nature. She's going to dictate, if you live on a farm, she's going to dictate much of your life. And you better get used to it, and you better be comfortable with it, and you better learn how to adjust to it. There were a lot of mental health problems, many farm women in winter, because they were so isolated and didn't have a chance to talk to anybody other than their own family. The men would go to the mill or to the cheese factory, uh, but the women, well, they would get to church and maybe to town once a week or every two weeks. So they would do things like quilting bees. That means all of the neighbor women would come to our house in the dining room where this great big thing was set up, big framework with a quilt on it. And all these women would sit around and sew, and they spend all afternoon, and they would do that for many days. Well, it was as much a social event as it was a quilting bee. And it was wonderful, because great fancy quilts came out of this. The interactions of people who are now somewhat isolated because travel is more difficult uh, become very important, and winter enhances that. And sometimes I think we've forgotten uh, in our hurry-up society the importance of neighbors and the value of community. Winter forges in our minds the importance of those relationships. There were housewarmings. If new neighbors moved in, we would all go there and welcome them. One of our neighbor's daughter uh, was, uh, was married and they had a reception for us at their house on a cold winter Saturday night. They lived about a mile away from us. Everybody walked, we walked everywhere, day and night, we walked. If it was two miles or less, we walked, sometimes even more than that. As we approached the Rapp farm, we could hear on this cold winter night music. So we knew that our three musicians in our neighborhood were performing. These guys played at all kinds of different things. They played at the school and they played all over the place. All farmers, they weren't full-time musicians. Let's see, there was Harry Banks, Englishman. He played a violin uh, and he had a finger missing on his left hand so he could uh, somehow work the violin with, I think just like this finger was missing, he'd got it caught in a moor accident. So he's, he's playing his violin. And then we've got Pinky Ezerhut who played the banjo. His real name was Elvin. None of us knew that until he died. It was in the obituary. It says Elvin. I could see why he didn't want anybody to know that. He had red hair, so he was Pink, Pinky Ezerhut, German banjo. Then there was Frank Kolka, Czech, Czechoslovakia, Bohemian. He played a button concertina. And all three of these musicians could not read a note of music. There was no music in sight when they played. And so we're coming down the country road and hearing this music, and we come to the Rab Farm, and all the neighbors are there, and they're congratulating the, the married couple. And there's free beer, and these three musicians are playing. And all of the furniture is pushed aside, and people are dancing. Dancing the polka, dancing the old-time waltz, dancing the shottish 
One, two, three, hop. One, two, three, hop, 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 hop. I haven't danced a shot ish in years, but that's how it goes. And then, in the middle of it all, Frank Kolka knew all of these Czech folk songs, tunes from the old country, haunting songs. And Frank would sit there and play, and people would just listen. And then someone would say, it's time for the polka. And Frank is back on his concertina, changes the mood entirely. The fiddle starts going, the banjo starts thumbing, and everybody is dancing and having a wonderful time. And this goes on until midnight or so, at which time there's this enormous meal that comes out. Sausage and dill pickles and rye bread and sauerkraut. Of course, we were always hungry as kids. We were looking forward to that big, big dinner afterwards. Watched people dance and thought that was kind of strange to see people jumping around like they were goofy. And we always enjoyed seeing somebody that maybe had one beer too many and how stupid they were. And <laughs> now, there wasn't any problem with people being caught for driving under the influence because nobody was driving. And besides, once you were outside and you had a little too much to drink, after you'd walked for about a quarter of a mile and it's five below zero, you were in good shape. You, you were fine. <laughs> We would do that once or twice a winter, maybe three times. And I don't think people really realized what was happening, other than they knew it was good. Everybody came, people who liked each other and people who didn't like each other. During those times, the latter years of the Depression, when things were really tough all over this country, and in Washera County especially, because Western Washera County where I grew up was a sandy, poor farm community forever. And the Depression was especially difficult. And then after that immediately comes World War II, when everybody has relatives or sons in the war. So it's a tough time. But with these three musicians, oh, how valuable they were to our community. And they, you could see they were having a grand time themselves. They were laughing and kidding each other. And I don't know who was in charge, I guess nobody. They just said, let's do the old time waltz or let's do a shottish. Today, I so much want to give credit to these rural bands and especially Frank, Pinky and Harry, who made life so much more pleasant for us during times when life wasn't that pleasant. I enjoy winter. I like to see a snowfall. I enjoy the quiet. Oh, the quiet of winter is just wonderful. When you stand outside and there's no sound at all. And maybe a little breeze will come up and you'll hear the wind rustling the bare limbs of the trees. Nobody said to do it, that when you are out, you should stop and listen. Nobody ever said that, but we did. It was a wonderful way of just getting in touch with another side of nature that you don't see in the summer. It's a profound experience to begin to understand the nuances of winter, the sounds of winter that are special, the sights of winter that are special. Winter creates, for those who have grown up with it, an attitude, a perspective, a way of thinking that is different, I believe, from those who've not had that experience. Now, just as we were anticipating the coming of winter, we are anticipating the coming of spring. The sun is higher, 
and we are waiting for the first southwest wind to begin blowing in because when the wind switched from the northwest to the southwest, we knew that weather was about to change. Now, winter was always reluctant to leave. So sometimes it would be way into March before we'd wake up one morning and the eaves would be dripping and walking to the barn, the snow would be mushy. And in the barn, you could tell that not only did I feel spring, the animals were anticipating spring as well. You could tell they were antsy. They wanted to get outside. When you leave them outside, they are running like they are crazy animals. The cows are running with their tails up in the air and they're jumping up and down and they're feigning little fights with each other and the young stock are roaring or running around the place like crazy animals. There was a great excitement now with the anticipation of spring. So it wasn't just the people. Now walking to school, Spring was a mess because the road was muddy. It's good in the morning, it's frozen because you'd walk on top of the ruts. But in the afternoon, you'd come home, everything was mud. My mother hated mud and there was mud everywhere. And the geese are flying north, that's another sure sign. I can remember from horizon to horizon when the sun is setting, there are geese, Canada geese, flying north. They knew that there was spring in the air and they were happy and they were talking to each other. And I can imagine what they were saying. Well, Mabel, what do you think it's going to be like in Manitoba this summer? <laughs> and by May, the whippoorwills are calling. And my dad said, do you know what they're saying? They're saying, plant your corn, plant your corn, plant your corn. <laughs> From the first day in spring, everything that we did all summer long was in service to winter. From the last day of winter to the first day of the next winter, it was preparation for that season. As I reflect back on when I was a kid way back in the 30s and 40s and early 50s, winters have changed. Our winters are not as long as they were. It's been a long time since I experienced 35 below zero. In recent years, we've not had the snowfalls either uh, that we had in the early days. And though we may on occasion have a hint of a blizzard, I don't think I've seen anything like we had back when I was a kid. So the season itself has changed. Also, today, there are not very many people anymore who grew up on farms. We, we are in a definite minority. And there are only about 2% uh, of the population in the country that lives on farms and actively farm. So it's a very small number. Uh, so the number of people who've had a direct experience with nature in the country, that number is much smaller. And thus, unfortunately for many, their view of winter, it's an annoyance, it's something that prevents them from doing what they want to do. It interferes with schedules. We had problems on the farm. The pipes would freeze and the water heater didn't work in the tank. But th that's part of it. One of the characteristics of farm people, especially of my generation and my dad's generation, the closeness to nature, I think, was never more. Why? because the very survival of farm people depended on an understanding of, an appreciation for, and a reverence toward nature. The idea that you can control it somehow was not in anybody's vocabulary. We are, as human beings, not a part from, but a part of nature. And once we realize that the connection of human beings to other life, to the land, to the weather, water, and the air, once we realize that we are a part of that, we can relax, enjoy, appreciate, and not be so upset when things don't go the way we think they should because of the weather. I learned all that from my father.
reluctant to get up in the morning on those cold winter days because, you know, the room was colder than thunder in the hallway. Outside, the room was colder still. There wasn't any heat there at all. And you knew that the house downstairs wasn't all that warm because Pa would have started the fire maybe a half an hour before he took the stove poker and rapped on the chimney, which was my alarm clock. One foot out of the bed, thump, thump, thump on the floor. He knew what I was up to. Time to get up, I know you're not up. And so I'd finally get up, gather up my clothes. Of course, I slept with my long underwear on and my socks. Run down the hall as fast as I could, down the stairway and park myself in front of the round oak heater. With the front of me nice and toasty and the back of me freezing to death. A Farm Winter with Jerry Apps was funded in part by Holiday Vacations Ron and Colleen Wires The Edward J. Ocre Foundation The Wisconsin History Fund with support from the National Endowment for the Humanities and the Friends of Wisconsin Public Television